I'm so happy to see everybody here. Good evening. Uh, welcome to St. John's College. Uh, my name is Manal Matani, and I have the pleasure of serving as the senior advisor to the provost on racialized faculty here at UBC, as well as serving as a social professor at the Institute for Social Justice. I want to thank you for coming out to this tonight, our evening, this is our second Ignite event here at UBC. <coughs> it's designed to open up space and stimulate dialogue and discussion around race, indigeneity, and leadership here at UBC. Mm. Ignite is one of several key initiatives this year that work to recognize and embrace the diversity of our faculty community. It provides an intentional space for racialized faculty to share their experiences. The Ignite Book Club has been designed with and for racialized faculty to, to allow for the exploration in particular of racialized memoirs and novels written by racialized authors. And tonight I'm so delighted to welcome Dr. Candace Hallison and Desley Cole in conversation. But before I do that, I want to draw your attention to a few other events occurring in the next few months, which I hope you will also be able to attend. So up there on the screen you can see these are some of the events we have planned for you over the next few months. Coming up on March 12th, Kennedy Dashgard will be in conversation with Shireen Eschke, who happens to be the head of the Asian Library here at UBC about Anahit's new memoir called Breaking the Ocean. On March 26th, join us as celebrated Giller winner, Dr. Ian Williams, Assistant Professor of Creative Writing, is gonna be interviewing Randy Boyagoda. So I approached Ian and I said, who would you like to interview? Because I know you've been doing a lot of interviews yourself. And he said, I wanna interview Randy Boyagoda about his novel. So this has been Ian's choice. And on April 7th, David Lamb Chair in Multicultural Education, Dr. Annette Henry, will be interviewing Tessa McWatt, Professor of Creative Writing, about her new memoir, Shame on Me, An Anatomy of Race and Belonging, which I'm sure you've seen has gotten rave reviews in The Guardian. And I want to remind you all that you can get free copies of these books from the Equity and Inclusion Office if you haven't already received your copies. Also coming up, <coughs> I'm also pleased to announce the next speaker in our series is the Provost Distinguished Lecture Series on Race and Leadership, Dr. Arig Alsheba, the Associate Vice President of Equity and Inclusion at McMaster University. She's a remarkable speaker, and she's going to be sharing her insights into being, feeling, and doing inclusive leadership. That's on March 19th, and I encourage you to RSVP early. I want to make sure I thank our partner, St. John's College. Henry, thank you so much. He's waiting in the back. Thank you, Henry. The Equity and Inclusion Office, IPPOC Connections, thank you, Marnie, for all your support. Faculty of Arts, Public Humanities Hub, and also I want to make sure to thank our provost, Dr. Andrew Zeri, for committing so clearly to the recruitment and retention of racialized faculty through his support for these initiatives. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you for being here tonight. Before I go any further, however, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that we are gathered here today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I think given the horrific events over the last few days, but particularly today, where we've witnessed the colonial state's forcible and violent takedown of indigenous land protectors and human rights defenders, I encourage you all to think about what you can do beyond merely staying silent during land acknowledgement this evening. Instead, as Desmond Cole pointed out today on Twitter, there are a thousand ways people can disrupt in solidarity with the Lesuitan. Hope you will consider those forms of disruption today, tonight, and tomorrow, and in the days to come. I cannot think of two individuals better suited to speak to this issue of disruption than our two highly respected speakers tonight. I'm going to introduce Candace. I have the pleasure of doing that, and then I will uh, hand the floor over to Dr. Callison, who will introduce Desmond. Dr. Callison is the co-author, along with Dr. Mary Lynn Young, of the new book, Reckoning, Journalism's Limits and Possibilities. And you can pick up her Oxford University Press published book tonight, as it's for sale there in the back. I highly recommend it. Her book launch is also happening here on Thursday. I hope you might be able to make it to that as well. The emphasis on reckoning is important. They ask, who do journalists think they are? Who gets to decide what good journalism is and when it's done right? They ask not who journalism serves, but who journalism isn't serving. This is an issue that Dr. Callison has spent her career investigating with depth and precision. Dr. Candace Callison is one of the most incisive, careful, and clear thinkers I've ever met. And the chancellor at MIT has said that Professor Callison is, and I quote, an accomplished thought leader in science communication, 
having used scholarship to bring context and understanding to the distinct belief systems that influence public opinion on issues related to science and technology. Dr. Pallison is an associate professor at the School of Journalism and the First Nations and Indigenous Studies program. We are fortunate that she has returned to Vancouver after holding the Kathy Distinguished Visiting Professorship in Canadian Studies at Princeton University. She was a visiting scholar in the Humanities Council, and last year she was inducted into the highly vaunted American Academy of Arts and Sciences. While at Princeton, she co-convened the International Symposium on Climate Change and Indigenous Communities. Dr. Callison is Palton, an Indigenous people located in Northwestern British Columbia. She's a regular contributor on the podcast Media Indigenous. She was also named to Open Canada's 2018 list of Indigenous Twitterati. Candace is also a member of the Advisory Circle for the Indigenous Green Office. She holds a PhD in History, Anthropology, and Science, Technology, and Society, as well as a Master's of Science in Comparative Media Studies. She was a Pierre Elliott Trudeau Fellow in 2019, and she sits on the board of the Norwal. Her first book, How Climate Change Comes to Matter, The Communal Life of Facts, used ethnographic methods and a comparative lens to bring together the work of science journalists, scientists, and three distinct social groups that are outside of environmental movement and policy frameworks in the American context. And I think this report is really but vitally important in the context of the conversation we're having today. Candace has always been and continues to be a very, very important journalist in this country. Prior to her academic work, Dr. Callison produced, wrote, and reported for television, the internet, and radio in Canada, CBC and CTV, and the United States. She was the original host and co-creator of First Story, the first news and current affairs series on indigenous issues to be broadcast nationally in Canada on CTV. It was later syndicated to ABCN. And it is no exaggeration to state that Dr. Callison paved the way for indigenous journalists like CBC, Duncan McHugh, as well as others to succeed. For her early concurrent work in media convergence, Dr. Callison was profiled in the 2003 book, Technology with Curves. And of course, she's also been part of this independently produced, in fact, this is something that she's produced herself, independently produced film, traditionally Renaissance, was included in BBC's Museums of Anthropology 2003-2004 exhibition on Palton culture. Please join with me in welcoming Dr. Candace Callison and Callison. <laughs> Thank you, Kaltan uh, Linnell. Can you hear me? Is it on? Thank you, Linnell. Thank you. I uh, try not to squirm um, during the introduction, so I really appreciate your, your kind words and um, also the affirmation that we are on Musqueam land. Tausadan de Dene de Osi, Kaskia Estotsei, and Taltan from the Crow clan, and um, it has been. Uh, a really incredible couple of weeks here in BC, especially for those of us from First Nations that do not have treaties. And I drive through Wet'suwet'en country on the way to my First Nation in the summer. Um, and, uh, and I think we'll get into talking a little bit about that. But first, I get the pleasure of introducing Desmond Cole. Desmond Cole is an award-winning journalist, radio host, and activist in Toronto. His writing has appeared in the Toronto Star, Toronto Life, The Walrus, Now Magazine, Ethnic Isle, Torontoist, BuzzFeed, and The Ottawa Citizen. He recently hosted a weekly radio program every Sunday on News Talk 1010. The book we're talking to him about today is the newly out and already national bestseller as of <laughs> last week, The Skin We're In, A Year of Black Resistance and Power. It's also the name of a moving documentary that you can find on CBC's streaming service, Gem. The documentary begins by showing Desmond receiving one of several awards for the Toronto Life magazine article he wrote titled The Skin I'm In, which is the basis for the book and the documentary. If you haven't read the book yet, and you better, <laughs> the magazine article or the documentary, let me quote from the publisher's summary. The skin we're in, quote, draws insistent, unyielding attention to the injustices faced by black Canadians on a daily basis. The devastating effects of racist policing, the hopelessness produced by an education system that expects little of its black students and withholds from them the resources 
they need to succeed more fully. The heartbreak of those vulnerable before the child welfare system and those separated from their families by discriminatory immigration laws. Puncturing once and for all the bubble of Canadian smugness and naive assumptions of a post-racial nation. Cole chronicles just one year, 2017, in the struggle against racism in this country. It was a year that saw calls for tighter borders when African refugees braved frigid temperatures to cross into Manitoba from the US, indigenous land and water protectors resisting the celebration of Canada's 150th birthday, police across the country rallying around an officer accused of murder and more. I think people might call this book brave, and it is that. It's also moving and powerful, but the word I lead with to describe this book is necessary. The story and the stories Desmond tells in this book are long overdue in mainstream public discourse, and they hold multiple levels of government and institutions, including the media, accountable in ways I haven't read before in the Canadian context. When I said yes to Manel for this invitation to speak with Desmond, I never dreamed that the context of our conversation would be what's happening in Wet'suwet'en territory and the blockades and protests occurring across the country, including today. Twitter has never felt more like a lifeline for information and a bully pulpit for bullies. I feel so privileged to have read this book this past week. It literally felt life-giving in the way that Desmond articulates specific cases as symptomatic of system-wide problems that have a lot to do with how settler colonialism has played out in Canada. I don't want to get to that, but my first question is about method. Since we're in a room full of academics <laughs> who think all the time about how to articulate what's going on, what they see, patterns, systems, all the things that your work does so beautifully. And of course, you know, the intimidating thing about books is that they seem so seamless when published. <laughs> so one of the underlying points of your book is that this could have been any year that you chronicled. The, the stories you tell have been going on before and they have continued after. So why 2017? How did you come to think about the book as a year-long chronicle of that year? Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Candice. And uh, just in respect to Mel's introduction, I want to say that uh, I, I feel like to the extent that you have opened up space and made gains that other journalists, indigenous journalists in particular, have benefited from that I have as well. And I want to say thank you to you, that it's such a nice thing to be sitting here together right now. Because um, it really is a challenging media landscape that we're dealing with in this country, and I know we're going to talk about that. So with your question, why 2017? Um, I got this deal in 2015. I wrote that piece, The Skin I'm In for Toronto Life magazine, about my own experiences of being profiled by the police in southern Ontario. Uh, and what that has meant for my understanding of my country and of policing. That piece did very well. Um, I thought it would, but I probably wasn't prepared for the way that it really blew up and then everything started, all these opportunities started opening up, including different book publishers approaching me and saying, have you ever thought about writing a book, which I honestly hadn't. Um, I say in the book that I probably thought, if anything, as a young person growing up and like keeping a journal for myself, I probably thought I was going to be a fiction writer because that was all I knew. Like I, I know that there's such thing as like writing stories and that you make up stories, you imagine them. And I thought that if I was going to be any kind of writer, it was going to be that kind. I didn't think I was going to be a journalist. I did not go to journalism school. High school is the last level of education I formally attained. I dropped out of university, so it was anybody's guess that this was gonna be me and my life. But in 2015, after I wrote that piece, after I'd been a journalist for several years, and then 
this book offer came. I said, yes, but please give me some time to figure out what I'm gonna do here. Cause I, don't, I didn't have a book like on deck, you know, like I have no idea. And it took me two years to um, keep living my life and trying to earn a living as a freelance journalist, but also try to think about what this book was gonna be. And um, what happened, I guess, was that in the summer of 2017, I was having a conversation. Toronto is home to a lot of incredible black writers and academics. Um, Renaldo Walcott, Christina Sharp, Idil Abdullahi, and Dion Brand. We were all in the same place. And Dion Brand was like, how's your book going? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't really want to talk to you about this. <laughs> the scariest question. Yeah. Uh, because Dion is somebody that I really look up to, but I, she was incredibly gracious because I started telling her what I was thinking about, you know? And I guess 2017, was it 2017 when, I, time is so weird, but Policing Black Lives came out by Robin Maynard. I don't remember what year, but Robin wrote the book that I think a lot of us wanted to write. She wrote a book really talking about police violence in the Canadian context as historical and really an important like historical grounding of what we experience every day. And I thought I was gonna do something very historical too when I got this book deal. And when I told that to Dion and like, okay, this is kind of what I'm thinking, and it was very half-baked, she said, don't do that. Like, just bluntly, don't. And she said, you know, you're living in a really important and interesting time. You're being a journalist and an activist during that time. Write about what's happening for you right now. And I took her very literally. So it was the middle of 2017. And I had this story idea about, um, it had just happened before this conversation, that I had run into this young man at the grocery store. And like 10 years probably before that, I was a youth worker at a community center and he was a young person playing basketball at that community center. And so we knew each other through that. And then like 10 years later, right before this conversation with Dion, I run into him at the grocery store. I had been fighting with a lot of other people against the police officers and schools program in Toronto, the SRO program. And he said, I saw you on TV fighting about that. And it reminded me of some of the stuff that used to go down in our community center. And I had no idea what he was talking about. But he would later explain to me when we met up again that the police at the community center that I worked at used to stop him and the other young men in the basketball program before they would leave most nights. I didn't know this because I didn't supervise that program, but I bet you even if I had supervised it, I might still not have known. And what the police would do, who were a part of another program in the community center, is that they would kind of trap these young, mostly black men who were gonna, not, they're not men, they're teenage boys, trying to leave the community center after playing basketball and tell them, you can't leave from here until you identify yourself. Until you identify yourself to the police who just happen to be here for another program. When police want to access our community spaces, right? When police tell us that they're trying to build relationships, this is actually what they're doing. This is their idea of relationship building. The police are always on duty. That's why they insist on coming to a community center like the one I worked at in full uniform with a gun and a taser, and a baton, and a set of handcuffs. Because if anything goes down, in their mind, like I have to be, I'm, I'm a soldier, I have to be on duty. And so this young man told me about how he was being surveilled, and the other young men in that program were being surveilled. And he related it back to the fight 10 years forward into the future that he saw me fighting on TV about cops in schools. And it just made me think about how black people are so brilliant about how this young man is making this synthesis between a policing program in a school and the policing that he faced in a community center and how it's all set up as this ruse of we're here to build relationships with young black people, but really it's a surveillance program. And I told this to Dion and I was like, 
this is one of the stories, if it was a modern 2017 story, this is what I would write about. And she's like, see? <laughs> you just put three or four of those together and you have some essays and you, you have a book. And I was like, oh, it's just, it's just, it's just that's all you do, huh? Okay. Okay, cool. Um, but somewhere along the line after that, I got the idea that there should be 12 stories, that it should be, because I was like, I literally have one of these for every month of the year that we're living in. And then we added a 13th chapter because something really powerful happened at the beginning of 2018 with a young man named Abdul who the government tried to deport. And that was, that was kind of how it came to be. Yes, uh, it's so powerful the way that you end with popular yeah. stories. Um, I actually, it ends, by, it ends by quoting Abdul who says, I feel like what makes a person is their struggles in life. For me, reading the book was so interesting. I, I thought a lot about indigenous stories that I feel like are very similar. I love this um, this idea that a black youth would connect the dots and natural systems thinking, right? This is what we aim to get students to in our classes, the natural systems thinker, because he's already beginning to see the patterns that emerge. And I, and I thought about, um, we had an um, indigenous journalist come and speak to the journalism grad students. Some of you who are here might remember. His name's Lenny Carpenter, and he came and he actually talked to students and, and said it in a way I hadn't heard before about how his own history meant that the system was stacked against him from the beginning. And so I hear in so many of the stories that you tell in the book, but part of, I think, what the book does in, in such a powerful way is it moves to system thinking. It takes the, the very particular stories and helps us see the way that the institutions have laid down these patterns, the way that systems are stacked from the beginning. And I, I wondered how you thought about that when you were, when the book was unfolding, whether or not you saw that as a, a goal that you were trying to get across, because it comes across so strongly and so beautifully. Thank you. Um, mostly what I was hoping was to do some good journalism work and research and storytelling. Um, I think journalism, I mean, there's a thousand problems with journalism in this country, but one of them is the professionalism of journalism. That journalism takes itself so seriously as to be out of touch with what's really going on for people all the time. We're storytellers. First and foremost, we are storytellers. And that's what I wanted to do. Um, I also, of course, wanted to expose what I see as Canada's legacy of colonialism and white supremacy, to use that language, to stop messing around, because in my industry, we are not allowed to say white supremacy. Your editor will try to take those words out of the script without telling you he's taking them out. And I say he very comfortably because almost every single editor I've had has been a white man. So your editor tries to, for your own good, protect you from his white audience, who he thinks is the only audience reading the newspaper. That's right. Yeah. And we are not allowed to draw conclusions. What I do, so, so people sometimes misunderstand what I'm critiquing because people think, oh, you're saying the media never talks about black people. But how did you find all these stories then? And I sourced the mainstream media up and down through 2017, because they did write about the black person being attacked in the school, the black person uh, um, you know, having a negative outcome in the school system, the black person, the black group stopping the pride parade and everybody being angry with them. They do write about these things. But every time they do it, there's this feigned surprise. Something horrific happens to a black person, and it's like, oh my god, that happens here? Every single day, oh my god. <laughs> and we're so much better than the US. Well, exactly. <laughs> we're so much better than that other place where the real racism is happening, right? So the goal of the book was to say, we're not talking about that other place. I do not name the president of that other place in the book one time uh, because he didn't invent racism. 
And um, I just try to take that element away and say, what if we could only look at our country? What would we see? What would we see in the context of each of these 13 stories? It's more like, I guess, like 15, because some story chapters have two stories. But like, and, and yeah, what does it look like on its own merits in Canada, right, white supremacy, anti-black racism? I actually really thought, Candace, that I would do a lot more explaining to people. But I had an excellent editor, Martha. Martha Kenya Forster is my editor with Double Day, and Martha said, don't show, or don't tell people, show them, mm. right? And my inclination a lot of the time as a black person who's like just gaslighted to infinity every <laughs> single day of my life in this country is that I have to tell. That I just have to like explain and break down and like I have to like, you know, until you understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. And, 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 and Martha was like, you don't need to do that. You can show people through the stories that you're telling. And so rather than saying like conclusively, this is how I feel about the Canadian media, this is how I feel about white supremacy in Canada, this is how I feel about X and Y, Martha helped me to show and then to let the reader do some work on their own, to go from the place that I'm talking about to like, thinking reflectively about their country, thinking about the way that systems work, thinking about the fact that these things can never be a coincidence, that they are not accidental, thinking about the fact that, you know, a 1911 order in council saying that black people are not welcome in Canada because we are not suited to the climate of this country explains why black immigrants in 2017 who are crossing the border from the United States we're having such difficulty. That there's a common thread going through history. That people don't just decide that they're gonna somehow discriminate against black people in school or in, 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 in prisons or the like. So I hope that that bigger stuff comes across. Yeah. I, mean, I think a lot about the onus on um, journalists to educate themselves and to educate the public. And as you were speaking, I was thinking about how uh, when I was doing this book with uh, my co-author, Barry Lynn Young, one of the journalists we interviewed who was expanding the left said, it's not just that you have to know your history, you have to know when it's relevant. And that is such a, you know, <laughs> it's the what and the when, those are, those are hard things when you have these newsrooms, which if you don't know the statistics in Canada, it, it's mostly white newsrooms. You have very few, um, I would say, successes that you could point to of all this diversity and equity work. Um, I wanted to ask you a, a big, another big picture question. Um, I was really, I guess, surprised when I opened the book and I began reading about settler colonialism, and I began reading about the indigenous people whose land you grew up on, whose land you were living on, and, and to really hear this strong articulation of what's happening to black communities as set within the context of settler colonialism. I feel like I haven't read very many non-academic books, articles, anything that really articulated the way that you have. And so I'm wondering how you came to your knowledge of settler colonialism, because really, most people did not learn it in school, right? So how did you come to your, your knowledge? I didn't learn it in school either. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to our education system in Ontario. Um, so the first day of university, not the sorry, the for my first year of university, I went to Queen's University, where I would later drop out, but I had a politics class. My politics professor had been at Queen's for like, I'm sure, 40 years, and he was retiring the year after he was teaching our class. And I didn't think there was anything particularly radical about Professor Perlin, he was a good teacher. And one day, he did a lecture, talking a little bit about Canada's history of colonialism. And you know, Queens was very white, upper middle class and upper class, private school educated kids, who didn't really 
what was at stake for them in that classroom and what was at stake for me were completely different. They were so mad at him after that lecture. They were so, they were viscerally angry that somebody was saying these things. Because you get to 19 or 20 years old, to your point, and no one has taught you about settler colonialism in Canada. You just assume that this is white people's country. And when somebody tells you it's not, the reaction of many white people is to be outraged. Like, what are you telling me? Why are you, your definition and your version skews so far from my own that you must be a liar, you must be trying to twist history to your own advantage. And that was what this teacher got, was like this white male rage. But that was a lesson that I had to take early on and say, like, there is something about this that's disruptive that we need to understand more about. I have to credit people like Eve Tuck and Chelsea Vowell and, um, you know, a lot of incredible indigenous writers, Leanne Simpson, uh, The Inconvenient Indian by Thomas King is such a great, wonderful book that taught me a lot about my own history that I didn't know. And when I say my own history, it's because I'm here, because I was born here, and I was born in Treaty 7, and I'm like, the, you know, Jesse went to made this really great point, t telling a story one time about how people in his community were defacing this very ancient indigenous art that was on some rocks. And some folks went to talk to them about it, and one of the things that he told them was, you guys think that I'm telling you that you're destroying my history by defacing this art, that you're doing something to me. And what you don't realize since you're on this territory is that you're destroying your own history and you don't even know what it is or why. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's so powerful, you know? So I've had the opportunity, and I, and I think that that's the thing, I talk about the black academics that I've like had a chance to be around in Toronto. Uh, the people in academia have really supported a lot of my learning, and that's why this book probably takes on a lot of that feeling because I'm around a lot of people who are in academia, even though I've not really been, who are influencing how I think and giving me things to read and giving me things to think about. You know, it's interesting you mentioned Eve Tuck. Um, I, I feel like I'm, I'm always teaching that their article, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, by Eve Tuck and Ray Yang. And um, one of the things that they say in there is that settler colonialism unsettles everything. <laughs> so what do you think by bringing these conversations together, what do you think settler colonialism unsettles in black activism? Oof. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I asked it. <laughs> oh my goodness. What do I think settler colonialism unsettles in black activism? I think, I think that um, settler colonialism tells black people of these territories that we are placeless, that we have no origin, that we have somehow, that we are new to human history and existence. Because all of the Canadian history that I was taught starts around, you know, late 1700s, early 18. Nobody in Canadian history books was really interested in telling us about what was going on in Africa during that time, including the idea that people were actually leaving from places like uh, um, in Nova Scotia, excuse me, it's been a long two weeks on this tour, and I'm forgetting everything that I ever knew. But um, no. Um, I'm just dying, I need the book in front of me. <laughs> but um, Shelburne is what I'm thinking about in Nova Scotia. So my, probably, I think it's safe to say ancestors, because as a black person whose family has a certain history and lineage, I can't exactly tell you who all my ancestors were. I can tell you that the name Cole is probably pretty new to my family line, as are the names Hamilton, Davies, Johnson, where did these names come from? I think we have an idea that these names were forced upon us by the master. 
people left Shelburne, Nova Scotia to go to a place that would be called Freetown in the 1780s and 1790s. Both my parents were born in Freetown. My grandparents were born in Freetown. But we believe our ancestors were freed slaves who came through either and or plus the Caribbean, the United States, Nova Scotia, and England. And when the British were really scared that their colonies couldn't contain all these black people who were now getting their freedom and who wanted things from the British government, they said, you know what, send them back to Africa, let them go. And people founded this place called Free Town, where my parents were ended up being born. And I would have really liked to know that growing up, but nobody taught us. And um, so I think when you come to this country in the way that my parents did, it's like people say to my parents, why is your English so good? But, but you guys colonized Africa. What do you mean, why is our English? Why do you think we speak English? Because you colonized us. So there's this like novelty of being black and ignoring all the history that came before white people want to start talking about themselves on this land. But of course, they have to erase all the history of indigenous peoples here too, because they can't talk about the thousands of years of history that preceded them on these territories and they don't know anything about it either. So I think one of the things that settler colonialism does to black people is that it makes us like, Placeless, like you just arrived here somehow uh, by our benevolence. So it's not like you were running away from the British in Sierra Leone or anywhere else in the world, in the Caribbean. It's not like the domestic workers scheme was conceived because, so you, you colonize the Caribbean, you kill all of the indigenous people who are there, and then you supplant black people from Africa and force them to work in the Caribbean. And then conditions in the Caribbean by the 1950s are still so bad that now black people through this thing that you call the domestic worker scheme, are coming to Canada to serve black or to serve white people in their homes so that white people can go into the country of Canada and make a good life for themselves. But we're always new and we're always like, oh, you're, you have to be grateful that this British colonial power allows you to be here. Um, and I think another one of the things that it does to us and to our activism is that it tells us that because we are so lucky to be in Canada, that there really isn't a place for our activism here. That we must be so stupid as to glom onto what the Americans are doing. Maybe we have a fantasy of being oppressed. I've actually heard that stated explicitly many times by white commentators in the Canadian media that we want to be oppressed like the Americans and so we invent these things as black people in Canada to feel like we've got something. So desperate they think we are for their attention that they would say that, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so much of what you're saying um, makes me think of the, the similar things that I've been thrown out in the last 10 days about um, how Indigenous people should be lucky, how we should forget, um, you know, kind of the colonial histories. But also, like, what I hear in what you're saying is this sort of this challenge of self educating, right? About yourself about your family, about your world, about how you situate yourself within these broader systems and colonial histories. And I mean, I think that that's an amazing thing you do in the book where you weave in memoir, but it's not straight up memoir, right? It's this, <laughs> you, you, bring, you bring yourself in at the, the perfect moments. Actually, Manel and I were talking about that yesterday, just how you come back into the story at the at the moment where it, it makes a difference, it makes a turn, and I think that story about your family going back and forth and the kind of broader colonial um, colonial systems of oppression and dispossession, it, it's pretty, um, it's really powerful, I think. Um, Can I just say really quick, those moments are really a lot influenced by Martha, my editor, <laughs> the places where I come back. So the first chapter of this book where I'm starting in and I'm talking about John Samuels, an art gallery owner who has his art gallery raided by the police on New Year's Eve. And I wake up on New Year's Day and I'm sitting on my couch and I'm just scrolling through Twitter as one does. And I'm seeing that this black art gallery was smashed the night before, the windows broken. 
the owner, John Samuels, tased and held down by the police. Um, and then he's charged, of course, with criminal offenses for receiving a beating from the police. And so on New Year's Day, I'm like, so this is how the year's beginning, huh? And um, I wanted to tell John's story, but I wasn't so eager to tell my own. Martha made me do that. <laughs> she did. Because she was like, you know, the people who are reading this book need to know who's speaking and where he's coming from. So you need to give that context. So I talked a little bit about myself and being born on Treaty 7 territory and who my parents are. Um, in the, the chapter in May, where I take a complete step back from storytelling about black Canadian experience and just talk a little bit about needing to take a break for myself in May and like do things to stay sane and feel human. I had to do that following Martha's example from before because I was like, this writing is so hard, I don't even know how I'm gonna get through this book. In August, when I take a step back from the story of DeFonte to again talk about my own mom, and how my mom would be afraid when I would go out at night. You know, DeFonte Miller was 19 years old in 2016 when he and his friends were out at night and they were attacked on a residential street in Whitby, Ontario by an off-duty police officer and his brother. And, you know, I interject in that story to talk about my mom's own fears of me, even as an adult, going out at night and her staying up as so many black moms will stay up, they're not going to sleep until they know you're in the house because of the fear. I had to do that at certain points because it was uh, it was what people call self-care. I'm extremely skeptical of that term. <laughs> but, um, you know, Audre Lorde said that taking care of ourselves is, is, is radical, you know, is an act of, of, of radical resistance. So in those moments where I was just trying to take a step back and talk about myself and talk about my family, it was to tell the reader who's speaking but it was also to take a break from some really laborious storytelling that can be very painful sometimes. Yeah, there's a fine line between self-care and self-destruction. Those are like my favorite memes. Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> um, I want to switch gears a little bit just because you brought up DeFonte Miller uh, and talk a little bit about journalism. Um, I didn't know about DeFonte Miller until I actually saw your hashtags here for DeFonte, Vicky Mochama, who you also mention in the book. Um, and, uh, you know, just reading it in your book as it's laid out, was it, um, it, it was a fresh for me to read it again. Um, and, and I think, you know, one of the, the comments, we actually talked about this in class today, the Journalism yeah. 400 class I teach with Mary Lynn Young, about how uh, white supremacy loves to play dumb. Or in uh, Tuck and Yang's term, the sort of settler moves to innocence, right? It's like, <laughs> to me, those are the... Moves to innocence is like, I, I honestly think about that every single day. Yeah, yeah, it, I mean, it's uncanny, especially when you consider a, um, a story like the one you tell about um, DeFonte. And it, and I sort of, you know, you talk a little bit about objectivity. Um, you say that the false promise of objectivity in journalism reinforces white supremacy. And so I wonder what guiding concept orients your journalism. So if so much of professional journalism is oriented around objectivity for those of you who aren't in that world. Um, it's funny because I was doing a Media and Digital podcast just a few days ago, and Kim Talbear, um, she's a U of A professor, she's so hilarious. She's like, what? Have these people not read a book since 1970? Who thinks they could be objective? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, you know, uh, it, it's still a really big, uh, it's still a really big point of contention, and, and a lot of why uh, uh, Mary Lynn and I wrote the book that we did. But, um, well, I, I, I personally think that um, this is part of the immaturity of the Canadian media, right? Because the Canadian media doesn't want to take responsibility for its own work. That's where objectivity kind of comes into the picture for me. This notion that God's beaming down the news to your pen. <laughs> that um, if you just sit quietly, you know, you will not sway either too left or too right, but you will end up in this divine sweet spot in the center 
where you are not being biased. Okay, so this morning, I'm watching TV, and it's like, coronavirus, blockades, Harvey Weinstein being found guilty. Who decides which one of those stories goes first? Is that an objective process? Because you see, the, the trick is that we don't want objectivity even if such a thing could exist. That's the, that's the mind mess that you have to overcome when you get fed this notion. of Because what people supplant objectivity for, or for objectivity, I should say, is like notions of fairness and accuracy, which are not the same thing. I can be fair and not be claiming objectivity. I can be accurate, accurate and factual and have sources to back up my journalism without making a claim that my, my journalism is objective. Who does objective journalism serve, is my question. And the immaturity comes into it with like, yeah, if I chose to do 15 minutes on Harvey Weinstein in another country, not to say that it's not a big story, I'm not saying that. But if I do that, and then I spend two minutes on blockades in my own backyard, you don't get to criticize me because I'm an objective and professional journalist. No, I'm going to, actually. I'm going to question your decisions, and you're going to have to defend them as a journalist. And that's what we don't want to do in the Canadian media landscape. Um, we've also lost, with the professionalism of journalism, the notion that journalism is supposed to, as they say, uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. We have completely lost that notion, if it ever existed. I don't like historical revisionism. I don't want to pretend that in the 1950s everything was great in Canada. We were barely even human beings back then, so, like, and still seen in the same way now. But, yeah, like, this idea that we can just tell the story and let the audience decide. What is the purpose of such journalism? Why are we telling stories? Are we not telling stories to uplift those who need it? To give voice to those who the microphone is taken away from? I don't believe in the voiceless, as it's said. I don't believe in the voiceless, but I do believe people take the mic away or won't share the mic. Isn't that the purpose of the journalism? But no, if your job is to actually sell ads in between your journalism. And these are the people, by the way, who we're supposed to be all relying on to be objective and fair and truthful. We're relying on Bell Canada, the Asper family, Rogers. Oh, God, Ted Rogers. Why, why do we believe that this white settler Ted Rogers just wants all of you to know the truth and started the media industry so that you would all know the truth? Or did he do it to make billions of dollars? And then if a byproduct of that is to get to tell some good stories, that's cool too. And people have a hard time with this kind of nuance because they think that I'm condemning again everything in the media industry, that there's no real journalism out there, that there's no real storytelling out there. Hardly. Hardly that. But objectivity is a it's a shirking off of your responsibility to answer for the choices that you make. Why do you tell this story and not that one? Why do you spend 15 minutes on this story and only two on that one? And I, I really challenge the objectivity thing because if you were just to take something like a child getting hit by a car, how can you be objective about that as a human being? And do we want that journalism? And if I don't want it for the story about the girl being hit by a car, I definitely don't want it for the story of black people routinely finding themselves in the back of a police car or routinely finding themselves in a group home because they've been apprehended from their families. I don't want objectivity there either. If you can bring emotion to the story about the girl getting hit by the car, and they do, you can do it for my community also. And I like the journalism when the person in the TV is tearing up a little bit as they're talking about the five-year-old who got hit by the car today because it's reminding me what journalism is supposed to be about. And taking away that emotion because you're talking about black people, and now it's really important for you to be objective, I look sideways at that. Yeah. Just hearing you speak um, brings to mind um, 
Tina Fontaine, who's a 15 year old girl uh, in Manitoba who was in um, the care of the federal <laughs> care system and um, was found uh, wrapped in a duvet at the bottom of the Red River, weighted down with rocks. And it, to me, the, the challenge there was that the outrage that media is famous, famous for producing, wasn't directed in the service of that young girl or her family. And I think that this is, to me, this is the, the nut, right, which you're getting at, is the, the, the sorry, nut is such a journalism term. <laughs> um, but the, 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 pr the challenge, right, before us is that um, media is a powerful voice that can intervene, and where it chooses to intervene is a reflective of the system. And I, and I guess I, I wonder, you know, what role you think journalism should play in terms of justice and whether or not that's different for black and indigenous journalists and whether it should be and how we begin to have that conversation in newsrooms and even more broadly. This is such a big question. Too much is expected of us. I want to say that very clearly at the beginning. There's too much being asked of us as black and indigenous journalists. I worked at the Toronto Star for a year and a half, okay? There are people at that shop who have been writing about my experiences as a black person surveilled by the police for 20 years. They're on the salary, they're on the payroll. They have union protection, they have benefits, they get sick leave. A year and a half of me opening a mouth, my mouth about the black community was too much for these people though. So somebody else gets to make a career writing off my impression and I can't. So much is being asked of us. But it's like Obama being president. Obama had to make sure not to be seen to be doing something that seemed partial and favorable to black people. That's the irony, is that they tell us that when we get to where Obama is, then we can really make the difference. But the truth is, the only way to get to where Obama is is to actually compensate the other way. So the way that Barack Obama actually got elected was by being like, black people, pull up your pants. Black people, if I can do it, you can do it. And he and his wife, who are two extremely exceptional and brilliant black people, don't get me wrong, they had to play the white people's game in order to play to respectability politics and to not threaten too much of the white majority in that country. So, so much is asked of us when we get into these positions of the place with the big voice, the place with the big microphone, and that is unfair. Um, can journalism be a tool for justice? I see it all the time. I think that though my days of asking from the mainstream media, like don't get me wrong, because they have and continue to have the money and the resources and the power, we keep ha we have to keep prodding them all the time. But I, I, I am trying really hard because I'm very bitter about what I just told you. I'm very bitter that people can make a living writing about my impression and I can't survive talking about it and I'm scolded in the same institutions and the same shops for talking about what they make a living off of, that's hard. And I'm bitter. And the bitterness makes me wish that I could have what those journalists have. But because the rules are in order to have it, like, guys, if I told black people to pull up my pants, I would still be at the Toronto Star. And I don't want to do that kind of journalism. So I believe that the truly emancipatory stuff has to be, you know, the Ida B. Wells School of Journalism. Like we have to take our journalism into our own community and write about the stories that we want to write about, whether the mainstream is interested in those stories or not. We have to, because, because journalism, again, was never really meant to be a corporate pursuit. It was never meant to be what the majority wants to hear and likes to consume before they go to bed and feel comfortable at night is literally meant to unseat them. So independent journalism, media indigeneity is like a really good example. All the podcasts that are out there now of black and indigenous excellence in this country are a really great example. Elle Jones doing what she's doing in Halifax is an excellent example of people, whether it be independently or finding a shop where they're like, look, this is what I'm doing. 
you're giving me the space, and if the day that you don't like it, I'm out. People ask me, like, how did you survive five years at News Talk 1010, which is like the most uh, right-wing AM radio station in, the, in Ontario? How did you do that for five years? The answer is, they never tried to tell me what I could say, and when they did, I was like, well, maybe this is the end of our relationship, and then they backed off. They gave me way more space than the Toronto Star did, and they're a right-wing, racist-ass company. <laughs> I can say that now, I don't work there anymore. Um, but I think that there's this really big perception too in journalism that again, like the same way that Canada is better than the United States, and Ontario is less racist than Quebec. There's this notion that like the CBC is a more uh, ideal place for someone like me to work than News Talk 1010 or the National Post or whatever. When like CBC can't even handle my Twitter feed. <laughs> like, I could never enter into a negotiation at the CBC because they probably monitored their employees more than any company in this country in terms of media and in terms of trying to even control what you do outside of the job. And I would never get past them with my Twitter feed. Like, they'd ask me to hand the password over and that would be the end of the conversation because I would never do it. But um, independence is really, really critical. And for us being able to tell the stories that we want to tell, we have to find the places, I, instead of this, you know the inside, outside notion? You get on the inside, and then you work your way up from there because you've gotten into the institution and you will change it from the so-called inside? That doesn't work. That doesn't work. In order to be the black police chief, you have to pacify the white rank and file, period. You don't get to be the black police chief by talking about anti-black racism and white supremacy for 30 years and then they say, oh, you're hired. <laughs> you play their game and you don't threaten them and they say, this is perfect. He's black and he says all the things we want him to say. This is perfect now. And that's why we've seen this trend of trying to put two or three black faces in the window of institutions in order to shut the rest of us up. That's exactly the reason. And it doesn't work. So when we're able to tell our stories and not be interfered with and not be edited, then I feel like we're really getting somewhere. And it's hard because the lights and the glitz of mainstream media is seductive. Getting that kind of reach is seductive. But we're talking to our own communities. When people ask me who's this book written for, I'm like, it's written for black people first. It's literally written for those who already know, but just don't get to see it represented in a book like that. And if I think about my journalism as a practice in general that way, I don't have to be at CBC. I don't have to be at the Toronto Star or the Global Mail. I can still find my audience and tell my story. And I really want to impart that on people here because every poet that I know, okay, if you're a poet, the chances are like people in Canada don't know your name, but you go to little coffee houses across the country and you find little towns and little places for your message and you find and you connect with your audience. That's what artists do. And I very much consider this journalism craft to be an art too. I think I'm an artist. And in that way, I have to connect with my audience and try to, instead of trying to do something up here where the lights are. That's really um, inspiring. I think for many of the, or we've got a few um, students from the journalism school here, but I think that's really um, inspiring to think about it as a different, a totally different, configure, differently configured path. I have one last question. I know I want to move to audience questions, but um, one of the things that was really inspiring <coughs> for me was reading about how you talked about freedom. That's not a, a, a discursive term that's much in indigenous. Um, writing scholarship, but I find it a lot in uh, black scholars that I've read and, and I, you know, I really um, found it to be a way to navigate through the hopelessness and the hopefulness. So I wonder if you would talk a little bit about freedom as a, as a, um, as a concept for you and whether or not that's changed after having written the book. Mm. Um, when, I think of, when I think of that word, I think, I think of it more in terms of liberation, which is like a process, because the freedom part seems like it's the end, and I can't imagine that. I just can only think of an ongoing process of liberation, and I like the word emancipation for the same reason. 
And in both cases, it's something that we black people are doing for ourselves. Because those same history books that I told you what they do to, what colonialism does to blackness is like displaces us, is that it then says that like, you know, Roosevelt freed the slaves, like fuck he did. Like, exactly. come on. And so white people enslave you and then take credit for the emancipation when it's us that did that. Um, so, yeah, I think of liberation as a process. And it's really hard to imagine what it means without negation. So I can imagine what I don't want to happen to me as a black person anymore. Because that's easy. Because I, you know, I've been really poor in Toronto for most of the last 15 years. And sometimes, I get on a transit system without paying my fare. These days, I intentionally get on a transit system without paying because our transit system is being militarized by our city in Toronto, and I'm like, I'm not paying for the right to be beaten down by the police on the transit system at all. I will not pay for that system. Um, but I can easily imagine things like, I don't want to, yeah, have to worry about a transit cop. I don't want to have to worry about walking to Stanley Park as I tried to do a year and a half ago and being stopped by a police officer asking me where I'm going. I can tell you what I don't want. But because white supremacy produces so much hopelessness, it also limits our ability to like think, like, OK, absent that, what do you actually want? And when I think about freedom and like liberation and stuff, I think one of the really big things for me that I've been thinking about recently is um, no one is illegal Toronto. I've heard them do this chant at some of their rallies, and they say, freedom to move, freedom to stay, freedom to return to our homes one day. And um, just that really simple wish to move freely. That thing that underpins so much of black subjugation is the fear that our actual movement is a threat to white supremacy. Sometimes I just think about that alone. Like, Imagine if I want to ship my book to anybody on this planet through Amazon, I could ship that book in 24 hours. That's the appeal. But a human being cannot traverse the border the way that that book can that commodity. What would the world look like if black people were free to just move where we needed to move without being stopped, without the border, without the ID check? And given that just saying that is so radical, what is white supremacist society so afraid of if black people are allowed to physically traverse wherever we want to? Why is that idea so terrifying to white supremacy and to those who benefit from it? I've been thinking about that a lot lately. It is the legacy of slavery, everybody. <laughs> it's the legacy that says that black people are best contained. Because our bodies will just get us out of control and get the whole society out of control. So we're better when we're contained. And I just think, for a week, if I could go anywhere I wanted to as a black person and no one could stop me, what would my life feel like? And why are people so afraid of like, what is the fear that would happen, right? Um, white supremacy is really good at conjuring up fear, but it doesn't even have to tell you why. Um, that is such a, a simple and basic ability as a human being that I don't have and that black people in general do not have. White people are much more able to travel to places that they have never been, have no citizenship, have no history, have no language. White people go to other people's countries and wish that people there spoke English to them. Right? What if we could just move? What would that look like? And I think I think I think I think about that in terms of the notion of like freedom a lot. But freedom is a process. Angela Davis said, what is the book? Um, Liberation is a constant struggle, or freedom is a, what is it? Freedom. Freedom. It's freedom is a constant struggle. <coughs> I definitely resonate with that idea. And 
it's the process of it, it's the fighting for it that makes me alive, that makes me a hero. On that note, we should dive into the laughter comments. I want to shout! I want to shout out every single black person in this room, and say that if you have a question, then you are going to ask your question before anybody else does. Uh, I haven't gotten a chance to read your either of your books. No, just one. Just oh, okay, just one. Oh, but even just the skin I'm in, I didn't end up. I didn't read that. Um, I have so many questions. Um, back to what you were describing about um, journalism seeking objectivity. And when you were saying that, I was kind of thinking a little bit of what Ibram X. Kennedy says about racism and anti-black and, and anti-racist. Do you think that seeking objectivity in itself is a racist action in journalism? Okay, that's a good question. I think I think that it's an appeal to the status quo, which necessarily reinforces racism. Because I think what's going on when we make these appeals to objectivity is that we're doing a few things. One of them is we're reconstructing this idea that if you just told people the truth, they would be able to do something uh, useful with that, right? That you, if you just are honest and, and lay just the facts out without putting your own prejudices and biases in there, then people naturally gravitate toward what's right and honest and true, and then they do something with it. Whereas, if you, Desmond, try to influence everything by putting your blackness first, then how is the reader or the listener or the audience supposed to determine what's really real? It's like almost as if my insisting on my blackness impairs their ability to think or understand. Like my blackness can't be a lens towards understanding, right? But this is not just a problem for me as a black person. Like this is a problem for every person who belongs to a marginalized group or a set of marginalized groups, mm -hmm. that we're never allowed to tell it from our perspective. So once you assume objectivity, you're assuming that the white, male, cisgender journalism industry is already kind of pretty good at just telling everybody what they need to know. And if you just follow doing things the way that they do it, you will also be able to tell everyone everything that they need to know. But there's no need to break the model. And I just fundamentally disagree with that, right? And, um, you know, it took Don Cherry how long, right? To get kicked off of the air. Because Don Cherry was supposed to be doing a sports show. But Don Cherry was the most political agent I can think of on Canadian television in the history of my life on this planet. Like, there's actually no more political person than this sports caster who does coach's corner and starts doing all of these tributes to the military and all these things and he doesn't know anything about the military but he's still allowed to carry on as if he's this ambassador and i also found it fascinating that the military needs this ignorant white man to be its ambassador why do they need he's not a military man he never served he's a chicken hawk why is he needed to um, give valor to this notion of our armed forces. But he was so political. Rex Murphy goes out here and takes money from the oil lobby. Peter Mansbridge, who read the national news every night, was going and giving speeches at the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. And these people want to talk to me about objectivity. I never took any money from the oil lobby. But no one was questioning his objectivity, so-called in the way that they were questioning my own. Not because I was taking money from an interest, but that me being black is too much of an apparent interest for me to tell the truth. No, that's real. So he's getting paid off six figures by the oil company and you're, you're just like, you know, telling black people's reality and stuff. Like, that was my crime. That was my bias. So yeah, in that context, it's pretty impossible to maintain the status quo and say that you're doing real journalism by black people or indigenous people. We have to be able to critique that structure 
And when we're not allowed to do it, when, so uh, if I can, I'm sorry, I talk so much and I've been on this tour for two weeks and I just like, this is, I'm like, maybe I'll never do this again. Maybe I will never write a second book again. So I'm like, just trying to have my moment and say the <laughs> shit that I need to say. But can I, I just want to go off for one more second. Can I do that? Like, when I left the Toronto Star, a journalist named Kathy English, who teaches journalism at Ryerson University, who's the so-called public editor at the Toronto Star, wrote a piece about how she understands why the Toronto Star took, a, it took issue with me doing a public demonstration. So just to give everybody the background that doesn't know the story, I was writing for the Toronto Star for a year and a half. And remember, I'm not on salary. I've never signed a contract. I'm not really a member of the organization. I just have the privilege of submitting freelance pieces to them and submitting an invoice in order to get paid. I go on my own time to do a public demonstration against police carding at the Toronto Police Services Board. I disrupt that meeting because the Police Services Board promised to end carding in Toronto and didn't do it. I've been an activist the whole time I'm at the newspaper. When they write about me, they call me journalist and activist Desmond Cole in the pages of the Toronto Star. But then when I do this demonstration and it forces the police board to cancel their meeting, I get called into the Toronto Star and told that I have broken the rules of the newspaper. And I said, why? And they said, well, you're trying to become the story. So when y'all are writing about activist and journalist Desmond Cole, you're making me the story. But now because I've done something really effective that disrupted power, you're blaming me for being effective and saying, we have to cover you and you, we, just, we, just, we just don't know how to do it anymore. So you have to pick between your activism and your journalism. That was what they told me, and so I quit. But Kathy English, the public editor, writes this piece waving a finger at me, being like, the Toronto Star was right to be concerned about your public demonstration, Desmond. There is a white journalist named Catherine Porter who a couple of years before my incident got into it with, I'm sorry to say his name, but Ezra Levant. <laughs> and she's an environmentalist, and he's Ezra, and... <laughs> they got into an argument at an environmental rally that she had brought her daughter to. She was also writing for the Toronto Star at this time. Catherine Porter then went back to the Star as a full-time columnist there and wrote a piece about her confrontation with Ezra Levant. I want to be very clear here. When these people talk about you can't be the, the actor and the critic at the same time, I never wrote about my Toronto Star or my uh, Toronto Police Services Board experience. I did it and I went home. And then they called me and treated me like I was on the clock and I have to come answer to them for a public demonstration that I did. Catherine Porter goes and writes about the actual demonstration in which she took part, which is the, the violation of the rule that they claim that I violated, but I never did that. She did. The problem was that she was inaccurate about some of the things that she said about her confrontation with this white supremacist bigot. And we know that because he had an audio or videotape of all of their thing, their exchange. And he released it. And he was like, when she said this in her column, wasn't true. Here's the video. When she said that in her column, wasn't true. Here's the video. The same Kathy English who would later tell me that I wasn't being a good journalist by engaging in a public demonstration wrote this treatise this manifesto, first of all, papering over the so-called inaccuracies, one might call them lies, that, Kathy, or that uh, Catherine Porter said in that piece, and then explicitly went on to defend her by saying, we know she's a journalist, you idiots, that, or that she's an activist. That's why we hired her. We hired her because she's out here as an environmental activist setting a good example for her daughter. And we endorse that here at the Toronto Star. That's why we hired her. But then when it came to my activism, nobody wanted to defend me. I wasn't doing that in service of anybody's children, I suppose, or in the future, right? So that was what I got. And this is the objective media landscape that I'm supposed to pay fealty to, and I just can't do it anymore. Sounds like white supremacy. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Aisha. Um, 
um, I'm a graduate student at the School of Journalism. Um, I just want to start with saying that it's, a, it's an honor to be in the presence of both of you. I think you have so much uh, to offer and there's so much that we need to learn. Um, I was listening to your podcast with um, Tamara and Dacker uh, from the Golden Mail and uh, I mean there were a lot of things that really stood out for me. I've just been very um, interested in learning about black history. Um, I try to do that in my own time and whenever I can. Um, but I think something that really stood out for me during that podcast is when you talked about something along the lines of how um, when you talk about being discriminated, people sort of dismiss that and say that it's probably something that you're perceiving, almost making it sound like you're being cynical. Um, and that, that stood out for me because that's something I've experienced ever since I moved here. I've only been here for like five months. Um, but when I wanted to do a story on something similar, like talking about um, covert racism, this was the question that was brought up to me. How do you know that this, they were being racist? How do you know that this was not just a one-off um, situation? So I just I just wanted to say that I, if you want to like elaborate a bit on that, like in terms of your experience, um, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the one-off analysis is a really big problem, and that's why I wanted to write a book because I didn't want to have to contend with say. Um, Okay, so I told a story in the book about um, a woman named Beverly who's here overstayed a visa. She's from Jamaica. And the government spent like a fortune to try and track down this one black woman who overstayed her visa to try and deport her back to Jamaica. They tried to force Beverly on a plane when she was 37 weeks pregnant, mm. and that her doctor had said it's a high-risk pregnancy and she can't fly, but the border agents really don't care. And um, that was a story that was very shocking to a lot of Canadians. But I know so many people who have been deported I know so many people who are facing deportation. Since I've been in this city today, I got a call from somebody being like, there's a deportation case that I want you to hear about. Our government, our colonial power, forces us to deal with these as one-offs. The reason I resigned from the Toronto Star was because when I go to Ryerson or Humber College or here talking, and talk to younger journalism students, I notice a pattern that the racialized students, but most specifically black women in journalism, they say like the problems that you're having in the industry, I'm already having them in school. Being told that I can't construct this or that story because it's, uh, it's not being impartial. So yeah, if I understand my experiences to be this, the, pro the, 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 the product of racism, then the white interrogator wants to counter by saying, like, how do you know what is in the head of the person you're accusing of racism? And one, you know, you, you asked about the, the systemic kind of like, like taking the bigger view of these things, right? Racism is never about individuals. And unfortunately, you as a journalism student are responsible for trying to teach the person who's critiquing you that I don't have to go inside the head of the individual to understand what racism is because it is not about their intention. So an analogy that I'm prone to giving is that if you and I work in the same space and every day when you walk by me, you step on my foot and you say the first day, Desmond, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. And then every day when you walk by me, you do the same. You step on my foot. Oh my God, Desmond, is this your desk? I'm so sorry, I didn't see you there. After a week, 
I first of all will not give you the benefit of the doubt that you can't see me sitting there. But the point is that even if I could give you the benefit of the doubt and say that you are unknowingly causing harm to me, my feet are broken in the exact same way as if you were doing it on purpose. That's the problem, is that you're a student and somebody who's in a position of authority wants you to account for what is inside one white person's head before you can speak the truth. And then even if you get to, they will often say like, oh, good for you for speaking your truth. And I'm like, no, it's yours too. <laughs> it's not my, like, you know, but this subjectivity thing, right, is a problem. And I left the Toronto Star because I wanted, particularly the black women who were telling me the same stories about what they experienced in school, I wanted the industry to know that like, you're not gonna pick on this next cohort the way you're doing to me right now. The way you're trying to gaslight me and make me feel like I don't know what racism is and that I don't have a right to fight for it and that concluding that I know exactly what it is and acting accordingly is prejudiced and biased of me as a journalist. I didn't want that condition in the same way to carry on to the next cohort of younger journalists, particularly black women who are coming up. And I left to be like, you don't have to put up with this. If they're not treating us properly, we can walk away. We can go do our own thing. We can write for ourselves. We don't have to give our labor to these companies that don't really care about our stories. Um, we don't have to be inside white people's heads. And double consciousness, which is a term coined by W.E.B. Du Bois, is exactly that. It's that dual responsibility that black people have of always having to simultaneously live in our experience, but then like calculate what white people are thinking while we're dealing and interacting with them in the world. It's way too much to bear. And so we need spaces where we don't have to encounter that in our storytelling. Please join with me in thanking Candace Callison and Desmond Cole.